This morning, we have a tale of two titans of the Old Testament. Two titans that were about to have their lives flipped upside down as their plans would falter and God's plan would come to them with a promise that would be delivered to you this very morning. On one hand, you had Samuel, a titan of the Bible. Samuel was just another judge in a long line of judges that had managed the God-chosen government of the promised people. You know what government the Lord approves? This is a good question, right? It's a republic. It is a collection of sovereign states who band together in times of national defense and the protection of natural resources. God put together his people as a republic, and in times of trouble, he set judges above them. Samuel was one of those judges. He was from a long line of them. But he was coming toward retirement. As a matter of fact, as we catch up with him today, he just had his retirement party, and he gave a retirement speech saying, my time is done. I've carried you through a war. I've carried you through all sorts of nonsense that you people brought to me. It's time for me to go. Now I turn over the reins to my sons. But unfortunately... His sons would be so terrible and the situation would become so bad that the people would want to throw away their republic and take on a monarchy, take on a heavy federalist system. We read, Yet his sons did not walk in his ways but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel and said to him, Behold, you are old, that's a compliment, and your sons do not walk in your ways. That's a thing we never want to hear as parents. Maybe it's a good thing, but in this case, his sons were terrible. Crisis was lifting up in the family of Samuel, and it was affecting his work. Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us just like all the other nations. We want to be like them. We want a monarch. We want a king. And so right before Samuel's eyes, this titan of the Old Testament, the republic, God's chosen people who had the Lord as their monarch would falter. And the age of judges would end. On the other side, we have another titan, David. King David. But he wasn't king yet. We have this other titan on the very opposite side of what we're talking about. He is a tweenie. He has a tweenie. And they haven't changed a lick since they left the Garden of Eden. Tweenies or tweenies? <laughs> His job is to go out and take care of the sheep and let his seven older brothers handle things. You have David, this titan of the Old Testament, sitting in solitude, obscurity, monotony, and the reality of the thing. He is a shepherd, sitting quietly in a field, not realizing that a firestorm of biblical proportions would come exploding upon his life and what he knew to be true. Well, Samuel warned the people. He warned them, you do not want a king. You do not want a strong federalist system because all they'll do is try and tax you to death and control everything you do in your life. The king will take the best and the first fruits of everything you have and leave the remainders to you, the breadcrumbs. And then out of that, then you will take that to the Lord. Out of what's left, you will bring as an offering to help one another. You don't want that. But they said, we still want a king. 
We want a king just like every other nation. And so he went before God, Samuel did, in his retirement. He even had a villa. Samuel had a villa. He had a lake house, so to speak, that he was going to retire to. But now he couldn't. He became a prophet in his retirement age. He went before God and said, Lord, they want a king. They want to destroy what you have put together. And, they, and, and God said, warn them. And so Samuel went back and warned them. And they said, no, we want a king. So Samuel went back to God in his retirement, wanting to give it up. Fine, give them a king. And so Saul was chosen to be king. And believe me, almost from day one, he was a train wreck. He made three incredibly big blunders. He, he would sacrifice without God's permission. He would run through things, not obeying God. He would put weird, weird self-promoting rules in place where you couldn't eat until something happened and his son would get all in trouble and he'd leave his son out to hang and his people had to go get him. It was, it was just a mess. And in the end, Saul just flat out disobeyed God. He just wouldn't listen to God because he was king. And he wanted to protect his image. He would go before Samuel and openly say, I have sinned, I have transgressed against the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people. I did what they told me to do. And you know what happened? The people panicked. Man panics. When you think your plans are better than somebody else's, when you think your plans are better than God's, when we think we have some kind of celestial knowledge that's greater in some place than the will of God in our life, I can guarantee you, you know where that path ends? In panic. They saw what happened with Saul and they panicked. They didn't know what to do. Oops. But once you get a king in place, once you start a federalist system, it's hard to back out of it, isn't it? It only gets bigger. But God had a plan. God provided a good and a new option for them. We read in Samuel 16. Lord, help me. Samuel cries. And the Lord responds. How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have now rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse. For I provided for myself a king among his sons. As they were panicking, God provided you see, God had a plan for them. And through all of this political turmoil, through all of this national panic, through everything that's happened, where's David? He's sitting quietly in the field. Hasn't got a clue on what's going on. Have you ever been that way in your life? Can you remember back to those times where you didn't have a clue but all of a sudden the next day you were hit alongside the head, either good or bad. That's David. Saul's failure as a king would lead the people to panic, but God knows what was about to happen. Behind the scenes there was David, and God was going to provide. The problem is, oftentimes we don't know what God's plans are. And so Samuel, in his retirement, mind you, bound up his horn, filled it with oil, and started heading down the road. He would make an announcement because when a prophet, when a get judge comes into town, it's like a, I don't know, a Supreme Court justice shows up. I mean, you've got black vans, so you have black camels coming in, you've got all the security running around. You know, Samuel coming into town was a big thing. 
And so usually you have to pre-announce such things. And so word got to Jesse, and he's getting his sons ready, putting on the cleanest clothes, washing things up. I mean, come on. Who are you going to present to Samuel if you heard this? You're going to put your, your firstborn and kind of go down the line. So he's cleaning up his sons, getting on the nice wardrobe, preparing for something amazing. Here's Samuel coming into the household. And of course, who would we choose to be a leader, a king? Who would man choose? Look at our last presidents. They're clean, well-spoken, dressed. Their backgrounds have been scrubbed. They seem articulate. They look good in front of a camera. We have a certain thing we look for. We look outwardly a lot. And as soon as Samuel walked through the door, he had the sons line up before him, and he saw the first adult son who was strong, who was accomplished, who had fought wars before. And let's see what Samuel said. When they came, he looked at the eldest son and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. This is it. This is the son. Look at him. He's old. He's strong. He's, he's been around the block. Look at how nice his tuxedo is. He looks good. Surely this is it. And yet, when man chooses, God corrects. So Samuel, I don't know how this happened, because in the text it seems like it was an instant. I don't know whether he sent a text, because it just all of a sudden it said, God said this is wrong. So I'm just going to read it as it's said, Okay. And then we, we just assume like he got a text on his God phone or something. But it was an immediate thing. Don't do this, Saul, Samuel, don't do this. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have ejected him. For the Lord seems not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. When we begin to do our own choices based on our own knowledge, look what happens. We pick the prettiest, the shiniest, the newest. We pick the aged, well-attended, well-articulate speaking. And God looks at that and goes, that's garbage. That has nothing to do with whether he can do the job or not. And just as God scolded Samuel then, look what 1 Corinthians tells us in the New Testament and carries on to us. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters, in my hearing right now. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of you were noble of birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. God saw something else. Man chose, but God came in and corrected. No, Samuel, that's not it. And so one by one, you know, I, I, was he looking for like a glow, like a pink aura with polka dots or something? I mean, what was he, what was he looking for? So the first son came, nope. Then the second son came, nope. Then the third son came, nope. Then the fourth son came, nope. Then the fifth son came, nope. Then the, then the seventh son came, nope. And then there was no sons behind him. And Samuel's standing there going, did I miss something? And so he turns to Jesse and says this. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, are all of your sons here? Is there somebody missing? My youngest, Jesse said. But he's just out looking after the sheep. You see, where man forgets, God remembers. His own father gave it up. I mean, think about this. The tweenies out in the field never thought he'd ever get close to him. He's dirty. He's sweaty. How many of you have worked in the field for a couple of weeks without showering around sheep? Okay, if you haven't yet, I can tell you one day smells like. 
So here's David out in the field, got his muck and his muscles and his sweat, and he's out working the sheep, and he has no time to prepare because Samuel will not have this meal until all the sons show up. So he sends word out to get David. David's hurrying back in. There's no clean tuxedo to put on. There's no shower. There's no making him look better. Hair's probably a mess. He's dirty. His nails have dirt underneath them. He's coming in before the prophet. And I'm sure Jesse said, this ain't going to happen. And yet, as soon as Samuel saw David, he said, you're the one. And he anointed his head with oil. And he would soon become king. Two titans that would come together where their lives had been completely flipped over their head. One, a failed, retired now, failed judge now, trying to work through it prophet. You have one shepherd boy out in the middle of the field, stanky, young, not knowing anything that's going on, clashing together because that was God's plan and not ours. I want us to remember today that it is not about your wisdom, your strength, your cuteness or handsomeness, your ability to speak, your cleverness, your wisdom. You must let those go. It is for us to know God's plan for us and for our community. It is for us to understand his will for our life. Because when you do, the heavens will open up. We read about Jesus today because that is God's ultimate plan for man was Jesus Christ on the cross. And did you see what happened today when we read about his baptism? Jesus came in and John the Baptist was sitting there and he saw Jesus and he said, I am not going to baptize you, Jesus you need to baptize me. But Jesus was following God's plan for man. And he looked John in the eye and said, it is good that this is done. And Jesus was baptized. And the heavens opened up. When Jesus followed God's will and plan for his life from God, the heavens opened up. This is my son, and whom I am well pleased. God has a plan for every single one of you. Just like he had a plan for David. Just like he had a plan for Samuel. He has a plan for you. And Jeremiah just preaches it. So remember. Remember this promise. God has a plan for you, and he is preparing you for it. I don't care if you're 8 years old or 800 years old. God does not care about geriatrics at all. You have a plan until your dying breath. Jeremiah preaches to us, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God's ultimate plan for us was Jesus Christ on the cross. But I can tell you right now, He knows you and has a plan for you. He's promised it. How was God preparing David for this? In solitude? In monotony? In the reality of the world? When you follow God's plan, does that mean I'll become rich and never be sick and live a happy life? No. But when we follow his plan, the heavens will open up for each and every one of you. And you're not alone in this. We are here to help. We, the church, are here to help. We're here to help you find what purpose God has for you. We are here to so that you can become, belong to a supportive community. That is what the church is for. So if you're grappling for the answers of what God has called you to do, what his plan is for you, we're standing right here and we're ready.
We thank God that his promises are always met. And I can guarantee you, he has a plan for you, and he is preparing something for you. And you can stand on that. Let us pray.